I've never been affronted by the idea of extraterrestrial intelligence. I've come to be affronted by anything which can be symbolised by initials. So I think CIA, MI5, ET, UFO is offensive. I mean, it produces a knee-jerk reaction. So I'm not interested in ETs or UFOs. I think we're talking about other civilizations who are not based on planet Earth. I think we are being taught perhaps one lesson, which is that there exist tangibly other prodigious consciousnesses and intelligences and that now they seem to be interested tangibly, materially, in making contact with us. It's July 1983. I'm traveling between government offices near Winchester and Hampshire, England. And I came out of some trees and I looked to the left. There's a beautiful amphitheater there. And uh, I sort of took a second look, you know, I was like, what? What's that? And uh, below the hill were five circles forming a cross. This was cold out of nowhere. It was me on my way to a meeting with this problem or that problem to think about, looking, seeing, and wondering what in the world is this? I didn't know what to expect, and I could see no tracks in the field. So I went quietly, made my way towards the nearest of the five circles, and it was the pristine appearance of it that so impressed me. The whole impression I got from really never, obviously haven't ever seen anything like it before, was that it really hadn't been there that long because the plants were moving, you know, and I could hear and watch the occasional one just pop, the head would pop up, separating themselves from where they'd been impacted. What I was looking at looked as if it was laid down in one head. It looked in a way so natural. The plants were beautifully bent over and swirled around. There were no marks. I looked for the obvious places. Now, if somebody made this, well, okay, maybe somebody, somebody, maybe somebody made this. So I go to where people would have had to have stood in the center. And I'm looking very carefully. I'm looking at these small nodules of dried soil looking underneath and they were still dried and not crumbled. Under my own foot, I pick my foot up and I look and it's powdered. And yet here in the center, it's not. I went down to find the farmer who was not particularly uh, happy to see me. Uh, he was, he was a, 
eventually forthcoming in so much as he was telling me they'd had them for years. This was not a random event. This was not just a five circles in this one field. So I go and I speak to this guy and I speak to this guy and clearly this is widespread. Somebody told me of somebody else who'd been inquiring, and this was Pat Delgado, and he had been talking to a Dr. Terence Meaden, a meteorologist in uh, Wiltshire, because Meaden uh, was also investigating circles of the same kind, same patterns in his county. And so the three of us came together. Um, we very quickly became aware of a light aircraft pilot. This was Busty Taylor. In 1986, I met Colin Andrews, and we were all together checking into the crop circles. Sometimes we were in a circle an hour, two hours. From the actual moment of discovery, we were there. Following Mr. Hall from Corhampton Down Farm and uh, Pat to the site of uh, a, three, a formation of three circles, of winter barley. You're still feeling the excitement from the farmer. I mean, he's, you know, he's just gone home, made a phone call to us, come back out, he's still out of breath, you know, and this is exactly as he found it. So the single track in there now is yours just last night. There into the centre and back again was mine. I, I just walked out, I, I wasn't thinking, I just thought, I don't know, bloody deer have been here, and I just walked out there, realised then I saw the other two, and I thought, Christ, we've got something strange here. So I retreated hastily, and, and these ladies... Now I'm listening. I'm looking at a farmer who's not knowing where to go with this. Very excited. It's like, have you seen it? You know, I mean, how many more have you seen of these? Where have you seen them? Are they the same as mine? I mean, do they appear in this sort of crop? You know, are they close to water? Mine's near this pond. Are the others? This guy's, you know, he's buzzing. And we would go out there with farmer's permission and we had a real field day and we really learned a lot in those early days. And we really found out some interesting lays and patterns. See the clockwise outer band here, outer ring. Uh, about a third of this is hidden underneath this flare here. Then you have tightening, a tightening clockwise uh, swirling pattern at this point, counterclockwise here at this point, and clockwise centre. Tr absolutely incredible. Very, very pretty. Wherever possible, photographs from above before anybody walked in it. That was report from the report. We, we, we would be able to say, farmer discovered it, he walked there, there's his track. Is that right? Yes, it is. We can account for that. What we would then do is that we would get magnetic north on a compass, and we would take magnetic north as our first radius to the edge of the circle, and then break it up every 45 degrees. We would see whether we had an ovoid or a circle. Crop circles were regarded as a subject of legitimate scientific interest and at least 99% of the people who are around the crop circles, looking at the crop circles, that's including journalists, scientists and people, regarded this as a genuine phenomenon. There was no suggestion at that time that this could possibly be um, a man-made hoax of elaborate proportions. And um, there were scientists, they were out there with all sorts of equipment. They had cameras, they had radar, they had other measuring devices, magnetometers, they had radiation detectors. Goodness knows what. I'll take the center one of the three. Okay. okay. Yeah. You could just move your foot a bit. And as you can see, this is a complete straight one. Yes. That's the angle of the crop. Right. This is the type of bends that was in this. This is like a cabbage plant, but as you can see, it's a 90 degree bend. And if you can imagine that was in the ground and there's just enough room 
for the leaves and everything else to be on the ground. Plant samples. I think the first ones in uh, the year that I started, uh, Pat Delgado sent the first plant samples to Dr. Levengood, the biophysicist here in Michigan. Can you tell me a little bit about Levengood? He had been at the University of Michigan as a research scientist. Then he went into industry and for a good many years worked in industry. Then, as soon as he could, I think, he built his own lab at home because he has lots of personal interests that he wanted to pursue. And he and Pat made these arrangements to get some samples sent to him. He wanted to see what he could see in the plants. And so we started testing crop circles all over the world. Uh, by now, I think, at least 350, maybe it's 400, that we have sampled in eight different countries, eight or nine now, including Australia, Israel, uh, Canada, the United States, Germany, the Netherlands, uh, England. We've done multiple circles in multiple different crops over 10 years. And what Levingood documented beautifully were the, you know, the basic changes in the plants that, in his opinion, were not caused by fungus, were not caused by pesticides, were not caused by unusual fertilizer application, were not wind or weather damage, caused by something else. Before 1990, we had circles, but circles in large quantities, and maybe multiple circles, maybe um, circles with rings around them, uh, circles with a lot of grape shot or little circles scattered around, this sort of thing. They evolved from a simple circle, a straightforward simple circle. It was intriguing, to say the least, that it started initially circle with a single ring, then a double ring. Then we have the circle with its nearby neighbor. And that neighbor was half the size of the mother circle, as it were. Those appeared all over the south of England. And then there were three, now two neighbors, both half the size of the, the central circle in a straight line. Now that was doubled and at uh, 90 degrees, so we now we have four forming a Celtic cross. Unconnected satellites, but a traditional Celtic cross. There were unmistakable signs of intelligent origin in the crop circles. You couldn't deny this. Say it was a, some kind of scientific phenomenon which was meteorological or caused by some ionospheric vortex, something of this kind, just did not square up with what I saw, which can consistently showed signs of intelligence. The geometric shapes, the, the patterns, the things of this kind could not have been, um, could not possibly have been um, made by some mindless uh, phenomenon like a vortex or a dust devil or a, some kind of whirlwind. It, it was simply out of the question. I suppose the bottom line is we are looking at bent plants. Uh, but bent plants uniformly forming a structure, uh, a geometry. It's precise, it's intelligently located. There is nothing random about the placement. Uh, they are purposefully placed. Some of them have this very complex energy print. Nowadays, they're all just swirled. The, these ones are very, very, very interesting because they've got this sort of energy pattern. And I, I always liked studying those ones because they're almost impossible. In those days, I was wondering whether they were made by people and things like this are almost impossible to, to, to hoax. These aren't just arbitrarily placed as circles. There's a certain magical way in which they've been laid out. If if you were to graphically present it as a grid, you'd more or less get that. 
um, a hexagonal grid or triangular grid, standard triangular grid, and here are your three edge alignments, one, one going up there, one going down there, one going down there. So there's a line just clipping three circles, and I call those tangents, which is what they're doing. It's one line, it's tangenting three circles. I was really struck immediately by the precision of the thing, and as far as I was concerned, it helped to explain the beauty of it, just as a graphic. So the only way to do this really is to design it to be such. Yeah. The chances of it being accidental or oh, yeah. some sort of natural occurring. Well, you could say maybe natural, but, um, but cert certainly not some, uh, some drunken farmers. For me, the crop circle phenomenon started on August the 4th, 1985, when I found my first Celtic Five, which was about four miles from where we are now. I went to all the museums, the London Museum, Salisbury Museum, photographed everything I could find in regards to Celtic symbolism. And from 1985 to 1989, all the symbols I'd photographed up to then appeared in the crops. I was flying with Basti, and he said to me over a place in Hampshire, you know, it wouldn't be quite something to see all of the patterns we've seen before all overlaid into one intricate design. And the very next day, that formation was on the ground, more or less where I said the words. That one was the Celtic Five with a ring around the outside of it. Uh, the formation is absolutely huge. In front of the harvester now is the centre of a circle, and it is absolutely enormous, very much larger than any of the circles connected with annular rings we've seen before. And here we come up to the first circle, which is formed on the annular ring. The heads of the plants on this side lie over the top of the plants flattened during the formation of the annular ring. This is definitely genuine. I think we've got a, a number one again, the first of its kind. So it was the two combinations put together then. Of course, when you check the, <laughs> the Celtic symbols, it's there. This was the formation that appears on the cover of Colin Andrews' book, Circular Evidence. It was the first really famous right. crop circle. To, right. to, it's the crop circle that got imprinted in most people's minds in, at the very early stage of the phenomenon. And it was simply a beautiful Celtic cross. It was very interesting that if you drew, drew a pentagram on the, um, on the outer circle, just hang it in there, it encloses a central space that is the size of the central element. And if you repeat that procedure, you take the central element and hang a pentagram inside it and um, fill that space with a circle. That circle there is the size of these four satellites. So you've got the same proportion expressed twice invisibly in this, in this formation, which is one of the, one of the reasons, I think, why it, why it is very pleasing. There's all this stuff going on, which is always, always the case in good design and, and um, good sacred art. And the interesting thing was that it was sitting on top of an underground reservoir and this is another thing that we have noticed with the true phenomenon, that it seems to locate where there's water, very close to water. It's something like 93 to 98% of the formations do in fact occur over this chalk and or green sand aquifer. Right. As the summer comes on and there's less and less moisture, I mean rain, the aquifer recedes. And as it does, it sinks down lower. As the edges of it recede, you get a strong electrical charge set up in the ground oh. because the water percolating through the chalk creates this charge. As the summer goes along, you see the charge increases. The lower the aquifer is, the farther the water has to travel through the chalk, right. the greater the electrical charge. Okay. Well, guess what? The numbers of crop circles cluster along the edges of the aquifer also. Then one of the questions that comes up all the time is why don't they occur everywhere? Well, we don't know yet why they don't, but this is one possible answer.
originally all of this land here was covered in trees. And then about 7,000 years ago, the people came here and they cleared the land. And it was really the heart of, of England. It was the beginning of farming. And there was a huge community actually able to live here. All of this landscape was worshipped as a landscape. And it was also laid out in what we would call the Druidic or the Celtic wheel. The place of the north would be associated with winter and internalizing. The place in the east would be sunrise and new beginnings. In recent years, um, archaeologists have discovered um, probably the most ancient um, site uh, ever found in Britain. On, on your farm? On Golden Bald Hill, which is next to our farm. It's much older than anything that's ever been found before, probably by at least 2,000 years. And what was the nature of it? What was um, Well, a habitation site, and people lived there, possibly dating back to um, 6,000 BC. In this area, you'll see carved on the hillsides a lot of white horses. And the white horse is the symbol of Britain, Albion. And it's the carrier of the soul to the other world. A lot were done in the last century. And when they dug into the hillsides, in many cases they found the ancient, the old horses. There are, is remaining one big white horse at Uffington, which has now been proved to go back to at least 2500 BC. They were meant to be seen by the gods. They were meant to be seen from above. I think this has always been an ancient, sacred site and an important place. Ah, and of course this has made such sense in terms of the whole crop circle phenomenon. Why is it in England? People always say, well, why do they have all the best formations in England? What's that all about? And this is the story, that the English landscape is loaded with all kinds of... We have phenomenal sacred landscapes. I strongly believe that man came here, um, probably from all over the world even, um, thousands of years ago, and worshipped here, and built Avebury and Silbury. Silbury Hill is right in front of us, known as the Hill of the Shining Beings. This is a very, very ancient and, and the largest man-made mound, certainly in Europe. And yes, there have been nearly every season, in the days you could climb Silbury, you could see in the height of the season at least half a dozen formations within actual sight of Silbury. In 1990, a whole new event happened when we got the linear effect because we got the shaft which joined the two circles together. There was something we'd, we'd just never seen before. The sheer wonder and magic and excitement was, was almost too much to bear. In 1990, we had the very first pictogram. We thought they were all like that. It turned out we had the first boxes, the first keys, Prior to that, they'd always been circles. It was that amazing Alton Barnes pictogram, which stretched out in the landscape 365 foot of it. And it was unheard of. We'd never had anything that length. But not only just one, there were three of them in the, in the area, which had all occurred 
almost the same night. And the interesting thing was that they had uh, additions to them, little sort of spokes coming off them, which scholars of the arcane likened to astronomical symbols, Celtic symbols, and, and it brought in people from all different disciplines and suddenly everybody was talking together. You got the scientists starting to talk to the metaphysicists. How many people do you think came through? A thousand. A sort of carnival atmosphere. Total strangers stood together in groups chatting away about, gosh, you know, what, well, what's caused it? I love, I love these. Look at that. That is a piece of history. Look at that. That's the first ever time that a crop circle created shapes, actual breaks in, in the crop. Oh, really? So and that's a hand-drawn survey of, of that. This is someone that's just gone in and said, what is this? I don't know what it is, but I want to measure it. And, um, you know, within two days of it appearing, Mr. Someone or Other has um, gone in, left his car at the road, gone down. His wife sat down and gone, wow. And he's gone, I've got to go back to the car and get a, get a pen. I want to measure this. And then they go back and they measure it. It's what um, Colin and, and Pat were doing as well, starting to measure them. those days it was evolving very very fast it, it seemed to be um, accelerating at an extraordinary extraordinary rate I had a helicopter and I got the uh, when it was really quite fresh and it, it was just totally amazing that so far. But it didn't seem to be part of what we where we suddenly called the genuine phenomenon. This is um, an alchemical symbol and uh, they've interpreted the various symbols on the, on the corners as being um, for its philosophical or mystical symbols. quite complex. You think it's got a basic three-fold geometry, but it hasn't. And you also think those edges are straight, they're not. So let's have a look. Superimposed on it is a perfect triangle. If you hang a perfect triangle orientated north, that one there is due north from the middle. So if we go 120 degrees west from that line there, it would have been a bit further north if it had been on a true triangular geometry then you can see the difference between where it actually is placed and the ideal 120 degree triangular geometry creates a little, little circle. And that little circle in itself is exactly the size of the circle that appears over here on this part that is precisely 120 degrees round that way. Every detail of these things when you start looking at them is so carefully thought through and precise that it's, uh, it, it, it really is mysterious. From the centre, there's an obvious outer radius to find to there and there. Encircle the whole figure, hang a pentagram in it, the arms cross to define the, the size of the central element, put another pentagram in it, the arms cross to define the size of the central element. And furthermore, if we point the pentagram due east, right. it, we exactly pick up this, this arm. And pentagrams pointing due east is the standard way you orientate a pentagram in the landscape if you're building a sacred temple. And then at a stone circle down the road, an ancient stone circle, you find the same use of a pentagram pointing east. It was exactly the same use of, of geometry. It was very interesting that the crop circles were giving me clues that were really feeding my research into stone circles. So we wonder what came first. Did there appear in the land in the original crops, these circles. And did they mark these places with stone to hold the energy there? 
The ancients had geometry as a scheme of operating, as a way, a channel between themselves and the higher domain. Stone Circle's been there for 5,000 years. It's endured. They're made of 50, 60 ton stones, some of them. And they've been there for 5,000 years, and they're geometrical. And, and the crop circles are there for two or three weeks, and they're also geometrical. And so although you would think that they're not related, they're not related in time, and they're not related in terms of their endurance, they, they are giving, if you like, a message. Math is a universal language, uh, and geometry is a way of speaking certain things. And we must therefore assume that one of the most powerful tools to, to understand the message is to assume there might be a message and learn how we must understand geometry in order to receive that message. In order to fully grasp what's going on here, you have to study geometry. Geometry is the organization of space within which all objects happen. So every object has a relationship to some geometric principle? Yeah, every object is geometrical. It's got all the natural world has geometry built right into its very structure. The principle of sacred geometry is? People who, who study sacred geometry believe that sacred geometry embodies the notion that all of nature is organized geometrically, whether it's the natural world or the unseen dimensions. The symbols that we see in sacred geometry used in churches or in uh, paintings or in uh, the occult world uh, all have their derivation from some geometric organization of the subconscious or the unconscious mind. Yes, I did call it sacred geometry because, uh, because I call it uh, well, symbolic geometry or geometry with meaning. I mean, um, it is sacred because it's eternal, which is what sacred means. The circle is, is the fundamental symbol of humanity on Earth. It has the most widespread symbolic meaning culturally. If you're looking for a two-dimensional form which has unity, it's the circle. There's nothing else. Scholars and philosophers in different ages have perceived this as not the most appropriate, but the only possible symbol of God and divinity and heaven. At times of great need, the, um, the gods sometimes, in, in historically, will communicate to, to um, man. And the medium through which they do that is always traditionally Mercury. Mercury is the messenger of the gods. And the hermetic arts and hermetic traditions have specific fingerprints, one of them being the pentagram. So the pentagram is, is the star, right? It's always used by wizards and, wizards and witches. Um, and... Uh, you must say, nowadays, how can we express that? And you can express it by saying that all the ratios of the pentagram are golden ratios. And the divine proportion is the most special, or golden ratio is the most special proportion of all, because as the part is to the whole, so the larger part is to the smaller part. The small thing to this is the same as this to the whole thing. The proportion of the small to the large is the same as the large to the whole. That's right. And even here, this is the same. If you follow this process of increasing the five-fold stars, right. this and this is the same as this to this or as this to the whole. 
The genuine crop circles look so harmonic. They include harmonies which can be found in ourselves. If we talk about the golden section, your whole body is the, whole, the golden sections. The, the, the lengths of the bones to each other are always everywhere in the golden section. So, golden section is everywhere. And so it's also in you and it's also in your mind. And if you see something which is proportioned in the golden section on the golden mean, you feel a familiarity with it. And of course you are, because it's all over in you. And you are a living example of the golden section. Even though we would find geometries in nature, mm -hmm. like in you know, the, uh, the petals of a flower, mm -hmm. for example, these geometries that we were seeing as early as 90 and 91 were expressing theorems that were not in Euclid's geometry. So this implied not just intentional design, but very creative intentional design yeah. in terms of geometry. Yeah. And that then created the possibility of it being truly another. Mm. Some other intelligence, very intelligent, creating yeah. these circles with these geometries yeah. and doing something new. As a, as a school math teacher, what pulls me into it is that nobody's ever seen these designs before or thought of them. They're not just brought out of old books, you know. Right. It's not just sacred geometry from old temples, it really isn't. Crop circles will have ancient symbology, they will have advanced mathematics in the same symbol. When we really follow this closely, we, we, we can see that, that there is a train of thought coming through. And there are many strands of symbols, and it's very articulate, very eloquent. To start with, they were just purely circular. Then we got into the linear aspect. Then one year we had insectograms. the year of the insectograms. Then we had the year of the, the curly men. Oh, that was a lovely year. Then we had the year which was very organic, where we started getting the scorpions and the bees. That was a brilliant year, that brought in Tremendous symbology. Then we, we started getting the fractals. That was exciting. We then got much more into the maths, the geometry. That was the beginning of the, of, of, of the really serious geometry, the fractal images. Where we've got the cock fractal here, you can actually calculate it mathematically. The cock fractal is basically a line, you divide the line by putting a point in it and basically stretch it out, so you basically get a triangle on a straight line. The thing with fractals is basically because it's recursive, you're dividing each line into two iterations. So if I redraw it, you can see each line is basically a miniature version of what was the previous one. And that's where you can see the crop circles come into it. And obviously if you went to um, three iterations, redraw it, each one of those in turn divides. So of course you can go on you know, infinitely with a fractal. In 1996, we had the Julius set appear very close to Stonehenge. Now, my friend Rod Taylor, who was a pilot, was flying with a friend from Exeter back to Thruxton, which is where we are now. 
and uh, they circled around Stonehenge and my friend Rod Taylor was taking photographs of the pilot. Well, they left Stonehenge, came here, Rod got out. The pilot got back in after being refueled and flew back down towards Exeter and then noticed this formation next door to Stonehenge. Now, they sort of worked it out, the time lapse between when they were there to get here, refueled, back in the plane, back, was about 25 minutes. And they swear blind that that formation was not there when they were circling around Stonehenge at the time. So we got a 25 minute gap where 140 circles appeared at Stonehenge, rather mysteriously, and really we haven't got to the bottom of that one yet. This is indeed the cue to the, uh, right the way up to this crop circle, it's absolutely extraordinary. Stonehenge is just there, and the crop circle is on the left-hand side. And here's the sign, come see Europe's best crop circle. The farmer has decided to open his field. Yesterday I spoke to him and he was uh, wanting to keep people out, was very angry about its uh, arrival. Now it would appear that he's thought things through and can see that uh, he's able to compensate for the damage by charging three pounds a head to enter, and now we have this uh, problem. Thanks a lot. That went to the dirt without being seen. So how many people do you reckon you've had here today? All right, about two, three hundred probably. Uh-huh. And I guess you're seeing people from all, all, all kinds of parts of the world? Yeah, we've had uh, Americans here, we've had Dutch family here, Australia. What, what's your own opinion on, on what it is that we have here? Do you, do you have a view? I can't see anybody doing that, any human person doing that, um, for a variety of reasons. It's quite a public place where we are. Yeah. So we never do it without being seen. I don't know exactly. Um, I think it's nice if we have one or two mysteries left in life that people can't sort of come up with sure. an answer for, and it is nice. Sure. So what you got so far, Richard? This one that you asked me to have a look at. Right, oh, right. That one, in fact, when you line up the centre with that and that, they're exactly in line. Thanks, Lord. Um, with the compass bearing, you know, we've been talking about the central circle and the open end uh, cutting either side of Stonehenge. Have you been able to look at that or confirm that? Do you have a compass yourself? Is that yes, the, yeah, I that? that might be... I've got that would be a good thing to do, I think. My, my compass shows from the centre of this circle to the right-hand side of the stones is zero degrees. Right. And the open end, which is here, to the left-hand side of the stones is zero the degrees. The centre of the circle again? Yes, centre. Right. So we're in the open end of the tail right now. But as I bring it back, I can see it. There it is. Set on zero. There, we got it. Zero. To the musicians, it was a bass clef. To the geometers and mathematicians, it was a computer generated fractal image, which they call the Julia set. That's why it's got its name. To the marine biologist, it was a perfect example of a cross-section of a nautilus, a seashell. And to a physiotherapist who counted out the number of circles, she said, well, that is the, absolutely the correct number of uh, vertebrae in a mammalian skeleton. There are families of circles like Julia sets, the, the Mandelbrots, and or fractals. And it's very interesting that all of them come in groups of three with each major themes, you know, the Julia sets and the, the fractal stars and the Mandelbrots. We had three of them, and they all followed the following line by its complexity and size. In 96, we had the jewelry set at Stonehenge, it was the single one. Then we had the, um, the, the, the triple jewelry set, 
and the small Julia said, or Julia said, like shape at Livington Castle. They appeared in this one, two, three, on a timeline. But the geometry or the complexity and the size was one, two, three. The same happened with the fractal stars. We had first Silbury Hill, which was the, the simple one, then Milk Hill with the interior one, and then a triangle like this, a simple version of it. One, two, three in relation to time, but then one, two, three in relation to the complexity and size. It looks like a plan. The plan was not just followed in one year. It also went over three years, and even by crossing countries, by crossing borders. to consider that this universe has all kinds of intelligences all around us that we have been ignoring. Particular intelligences can act freely within the universe that we inhabit. And they don't have to be our intelligence. They can be mysterious other intelligences. You know? I think that's really what's so fascinating is that the various domains of intelligence show that just like we are a particular intelligence within the cosmos, we can make art in participation with other forces, so these other intelligences can do the same thing. Well, I think the one thing that people misunderstand about art is that the viewer is part of the art. Right. The art without the viewer isn't even, doesn't even exist. Right. I mean, it doesn't exist unless it's viewed. That is what the art is about. It's in the moving through time and space the evolution and the unfolding of, that, of the experience. When you look at a painting by Van Gogh, you see a picture of a landscape, maybe some people walking through it and stuff like that. And yet, in that, you can also sense his energy, who he is, who he was. You get a whole, there's this, this whole encapsulation of this person. So if I was to look at and analyze crop circles, I would try to look at him in terms of like, how do I go back to the creator from this the same way I look at a painting? If these were messages coming from somewhere else, it's entirely appropriate that the thing would be witty, playful, geometrical, and, 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 and staggeringly beautiful and, and inspiring. The systems of proportion um, used in all sacred art and architecture are very specific. They all, they all embody a certain amount of geometry, and they, um, and they all uh, have obey certain rules. There are rules which um, state that you have to balance line and curve in sacred art. We see it at low place in church windows, Islamic patterns, all the rest of it. So the, light, 
the line elements of a design have to balance the curve elements of a design. Crop circles were obeying that rule. Another rule, you have to, you have to balance your light and your dark in any piece of, of um, good ancient sacred art. Again, crop circles were obeying that rule. The two-ness of it, the, the laid crop and the standing crop. Sacred art is supposed to be operating without ego. You don't sign, you don't have artists behind sacred art. The divine is supposed to be operating through sacred art. Again, crop circles were exactly following that rule. An another rule, your integrity of materials in sacred art. You shouldn't really be using anything that's got anything that isn't directly from, from the earth. Do you want to stay green and clean and holy? Again, crop circles are, are obeying that rule. And then you've even got other rules, such as the temporary nature of quite a lot of sacred art, that it's often destroyed. After it's made, it's um, not, not supposed to be venerated too highly for too long, otherwise it becomes a, um, a sacred cow. And um, again, crop circles, they're, they're being mowed down every year. Another good example of it. Crop circles are the finest, finest example of modern, modern in innovative sacred art for our times. There's no, there's no competition. There's, there's no competition. There's nothing happening in the visual arts or, or modern arts at any level anywhere on the planet at the moment that begins to compare with, with, with it as an art phenomenon. And there is no artist, certainly, who, who could begin to compare with the artist who is behind the crop circle phenomenon in terms of design. They are very, 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 very good designers, and yet they don't, they don't hold their, their head up. So, so who are they? So what, what is it? So who's, who's behind it? Why, why, is it, why does it bear all the hallmarks of a mercurial in intervention in, in some way, or, or, or even something else? I mean, if it's, uh, if it's the guys in the spaceships, I'd love to visit one of their chapels, you know, because they, they sure do good, good windows. Okay, you don't know, of course, where to walk. What we're going to do is we're going to follow the tram line, and then we take the tram, the proper tram line, to go up into the formation. So we just go in there. To be honest, I thought all the crop circles were big, big hoax, one big fake. There is a phenomenon, but I don't know exactly what it is. People are fairly limited in their way of thinking. They want to have the answer: it's alien or it's human. And I think it's something in between. I don't think it's, it's aliens. I don't think it's coming from outer space. But on the other hand, there is a phenomenon. It's not just one big hoax. Something extraordinary is going on here. And I think it has to do with our own being, our own way of thinking. Well, let's see. Let's not miss it. So in fact, in a way, we are creating them ourselves, but not in the, in the traditional way of putting the crop flat with a board, but I think we do it ourselves anyway. It's not coming from outer space, it's us. We are looking at ourselves. It's our own mirrors we are looking at. Okay, let's go in. From what I see from here now, it looks a little bit violent to me. You see, the crop is shooting up already again. It's a little cutting up. There's one thing I learned in all the years I'm coming in the crop circles is that it's very difficult to judge by eye just is it genuine or not. I tried to do that when I came for the first time. I thought, oh, this is genuine, this is not, just by looking at it, but that's very difficult. Every crop sock has its own character. So this is done in, in straight lines. If you can see, it's alternating. This one is on top, then you have this one, then it's this one again. You see the different layers. So if this is man-made, two people were needed for, to do this, at least. Why is that? Because it's not, um, it's not that one side went down and then the other side. You can see that this is, is over this again, but this is over that again. So what you need is 
two people do it alternately. I'm not saying people did it, but that's how difficult this is already. This only this small part already is not that easy. It's not that straightforward as you would think if you look at it for the first time. There are lines, you can call them pathways, but there are construction lines under the craft. This one is very obvious because it's laying on top of it. This one is less obvious because it's going under it, but when you follow it, you will see it's one, one big line. And the rest is constructed around these lines. These lines are not as straightforward as you would think. You would think they're, so it's a hoax, it's all man-made, but that's not the case. Sometimes there are lines that you don't need, and lines you do need, miss, are not there. The bending in the notes is something that only happens very occasionally. Uh, there's a misunderstanding about it. A lot of people think you will find it in every single crop circle. I only found it in a very few crop circles. A lot of times people will mistake, and I will give you an example in the standing crop. This is the way how crop grows. It comes out and then goes up. Now when, you, when this goes down, it gives you the impression that there's a bend here. That's not the bend notes. Bent notes are the ones, in fact, that are the middle ones, the straight ones, that are bent. And that is amazing. That's unexplainable. I believe there's a phenomenon. I'm not going to look for bent notes anymore in every single crop circle. I try much more to get the feel from how, what does it do to me? What does the shape do to me? But it's the general feeling. And I, all the, the plant research, I will leave it up to others, to, to Nancy Talbot and people like those. They can do this kind of research. That's not my business, in fact. I heard about this guy, uh, this Michigan guy, this Levengood, uh, who had started to do uh, plant work. I was staggered that there was somebody in the United States interested, I mean, delighted and really amazed to find that there was anybody, because by then I already had learned that there were crop circles all over the country. They weren't just in England, and they were in the United States, they were in Canada, they were in you know, other Western European countries. We knew about them in Australia by then. And both Burke and Levengood, as far as I know to this day, are pretty much committed to the idea that the causative agency is an ionospheric plasma. I'm a plasma that's generated in the ionosphere and then descends to the Earth's surface, goes to certain locations for whatever reason, the aquifer connection, the magnet, some sort of magnetic anomaly or whatever, and leaves these impressions in the crop as a result. Uh, the design aspect is the thing that causes the most trouble for people with that explanation. Uh, in fluid dynamics and in numerous other areas of science, you see fabulous designs exhibited all the time. I mean, you just look for them and think of the head of a sunflower seed, just think what it looks like. There are stuff like this, a common. I mean, how, how amazingly intricate is that? I mean, the shell of a, of a seashell, snowflakes. I mean, there are millions and millions of, of examples of nature creating incredibly intricate designs. I mean, I don't, I mean, the, the major point is, I think, for people who don't know anything about crop circles, yeah. is not to jump to the conclusion that because you've never seen anything like this before, right. that it is um, supernatural. Right. It might be supernatural, I don't know for sure, but look first at the obvious. We have still only scratched the surface of what is there to be understood. And it may be that many things which have historically been thought of as supernatural are in fact part of the natural world but occur only randomly or only occasionally or under certain circumstances and that they're actually just part of the natural environment that nobody's bothered to study very much and doesn't understand yet. The thing with science, the beauty of it is if you get a piece of information that doesn't fit, you have to go back to square one and you build another theory. You take in, you follow the data. You don't come up with an idea and then make things fit. You see what's actually there. And what Levingood documented beautifully, and I would guess tediously for many, many years, were the, you know, the basic changes in the plants. And he also discovered magnetic particles in the soils that are very unusual. Uh, one of the things that he discovered was that the seeds taken from crop circle plants 
grew totally differently than the controls. What this is is a bunch of seeds taken from a formation and a bunch of seeds from the controls in a lab tray. And he's germinating them. He has a germination chamber. It's calibrated to a certain temperature, a certain amount of moisture, et cetera, et cetera. And it's done in a very standard way. If the crop was young and immature, the seed was not fully formed when the crop circle occurred, the seedling was depressed, the seedling's energies. Often they wouldn't germinate, and if they did germinate, not strongly enough to, to be viable. However, in mature crop, where the seed was already formed when the energies hit, then you got exactly the opposite. You got increased growth in yield. Normally a germination is four days. All they're looking for is does the seed germinate or not. That's the beginning of what Levin Good does. Once that is done, he's then measuring the root and shoot development for up to 14 days in some cases. He's wanting to see what happens subsequent to germination. This is uh, this case in Maryland where the elongated nodes occurred. There were these swaths cut through the uh, crop. And it, the nodes are bent to the left and the right. Node bending is a natural response of the plant. If it's young and growing, uh, if it's knocked down and not killed, it will try to reorient itself according to gravity. It's called gravitropism. Or phototropism, it's just it's, it's reorients itself to the light. So if you go to a crop circle and nodes are bent, if you don't know when that crop circle occurred and you don't know the age of the crop at the time, you don't know whether this node bending might be due to natural phototropism or whether it's something that occurred during the event. If you get there quickly and you know that it has just happened and you find massive node bending like this, these 90 degree angles, this was part of the phenomenon. It actually bent the nodes. I wanted to show you the, the node enlargement photo the top is our, our nodes. These are stem nodes taken from you know, inside the formation. The bottom shows you the controls, which are taken at a considerable distance outside. What are the characteristics of this node lengthening? What Levengood says is going on is that the moisture, remember the plant stem is hollow, and the nutrients, the moisture which nourishes the plant, goes up through this, this stem. Plasmas, uh, a fact about plasmas is that they emit microwaves in bursts, pulses. Uh, his idea is that the microwaves from these pulses are connecting with the moisture inside the plant stem, just like they would in your microwave oven, heating the plant up, which softens it and allows it to fall. The moisture inside turns to steam, and as it does so, it has to escape. Well, if the plants are young and pliable, the outer fibers are pliable, the steam escapes by stretching the nodes. That's how you get the elongated nodes. If the energy is extremely intense and or if the crop is old and the fibers are tough, then it can't get out by stretching it because the fibers won't stretch or it's just too much energy. Then it blows a hole right out at the node. Okay, that's called the blown node. Yeah, and that's what, those are our exploded nodes. These are samples of corn. We have done a number of corn formations. These are crop circles that, you know, occur in the corn. But you see, what we're looking at here is these. You want to see the light coming right through those. The crop was down, and here were these expulsion cavities. The amount of energy that it would take to do this in full-grown corn must be quite astounding. When we do this sampling, a lot of people think that, you know, we take a plant stalk here or there. Well, we don't. We take hundreds of plants, thousands often, uh, say 50, 60, 70 samples, and each sample it consists of between 10 and 20 plants. And then we do the same thing in the controls, starting immediately outside the circle and going up to 500, 1,000 feet away in several directions. Then the idea is that you compare what you see in the plants inside to what you see in the plants outside. So it seems to be a three, some three-fold double crescent spinner. Yeah. Uh, beautiful to behold from the hill. I, I can't wait to get up in the air. Yeah, 
so how do you explain this? Look at the bend on that guy. It seems like maybe one out of a hundred have these bends that if it were yeah. mechanical, they'd all be broken. Here is this very nice looking, what I call a plumber's bend. It's absolutely 90 degrees going down. Master Lou found that one. It's beauty, that one. Huh? Yeah. Yeah, that one is good. Wow, you find a yeah. magical bang. Yeah, quite a lot of them. Yeah. Ah, oh, lovely. That's a beauty. All right, this, this is a case in Salem, Oregon, 1997, out on the West Coast. We found you know, node length changes in the plants in this formation, and we also found a massive incidence of expulsion cavities. The controls in this case were taken away from the formation in this direction and away from, this, from the formation in that direction, out into the standing crop. What we discovered was that we had significant node length changes inside the formation, and we had these expulsion cavities. But what we also found in the standing crop outside the formation, the supposedly unaffected crop, we found node length changes, which decreased as a function of distance away from the edge, and in a completely linear fashion. Those are the controls taken north and south. The node lengths are decreasing the farther you get away in the standing crop. Again, if you talk about man-made events, how did they change the node lengths in standing crop that is apparently completely visually right. unaffected? Right. There's a law in physics known as the Beer-Lambert principle, and it simply describes the precise way in which matter, any matter, absorbs electromagnetic energy. Well, if you're using node length change as the equivalent to exposure to the energy, then as that decreases, when it does so in a, in a, in a uh, linear fashion, it means that what caused the change has got to be electromagnetic energy. Because the Beer-Lambert principle, that's what it's describing. Then you have another interesting thing. You've seen many standing centers inside crop circles. Right. Well, guess what? <laughs> the standing centers often show as much change or more in the nodes right. than what you find in the down crops surrounding them. And the hooksters are telling you, well, they knocked the plants down, okay. Then how in the world did they do? What happened to the standing plants? I was just thinking, well, I wonder why the crops didn't fall down if they were affected. It's a complex energy system. Whatever this is, it is a complex, multi, many energies. You have an electrical component. There is a, obviously a strong magnetic field, another energy present. There may be energies we haven't described. The point is you've got, it's not one single energy doing this, and each energy is functioning independently of the others and chaotically. It's called a thermodynamically unstable situation. It means you can't predict precisely which thing is going to operate which way. I would think that local weather factors would affect it. I would think local geographical factors would affect it. The type of crop, the age the crop is at the time it occurs, all of those things are probably factors in whatever the final result really is. This is obviously a very fresh one. Uh, it wasn't here half past ten last night when we drove past. And we happened to spot it this morning as we were driving down the road. When we first got into the formation, the first thing I did was um, test it with the compass. And taking a bearing down these sort of side arms from the star, central star. I was getting about an eight degree variation in north from the very centre of the circle to about where we're standing here, this sort of distance. Um, and then from where we were standing here to the outer edge of the crop circle, it was all constant. So in other words, the fluctuation was occurring between here and the centre. This is uh, a case of the magnetic particles in the soils being dis distributed in a completely linear fashion. What we've discovered now in formation after formation all over the world are these tiny little rounded particles. Oh, look at that. Wow. You can't see a lot of these at the naked eye. But the fact that they're perfectly spherical right. indicates they were in a molten state as they fell to Earth, because that's how you get 
the, the spheres. We used to make lead shot that way, right? right? Revolutionary War, we heated the lead up and we dropped it off towers because it forms spheres. This is a case in Canada a couple of years ago mm -hmm. in this area of Saskatchewan. Those are several formations which occurred in one field simultaneously. This is the sampling diagram on that larger circle. And as you can see, what we did here were two diameters. Now, in every case, a plant sample is taken, let's say 20 plants per spot, mm -hmm. and a soil sample is taken. The lines that go outside are controls. Right, obviously. Okay, in this circle, that is the deposition of the magnetic material, the bulk of the material being found around the edges. But when you get this very tight linear disposition, what you're talking about is a force or energy at work. I mean, you've got, that's a clear display of it. You could think that people could have handfuls of this stuff and just be throwing it around if they were making it. Right. But when you get, when, when it's microscopic to begin with, and you get it, you get these clear linear distributions of it, whether it's node length or magnetic material, what it is. How in the world would anybody do it? You know, in, in this case, it, I mean, it indicates that a force and energy was at work that's governed by principles completely outside of human beings. It has nothing to do with us. The proof here is so consistently solid. It reaffirms itself every damn case. It certainly affirms that it's made, or th these things are created with the manipulation of some sort of exotic use of energy. Apparently. I mean, I've spent years being torn about the, the natural versus something else idea. And it's only since, it's only in the last year with a, an accumulation of a number of experiences that I've gotten to the point where I cannot personally think that I cannot understand this as a, as a phenomenon without some kind of consciousness involved. I have no idea whether it's my consciousness or the collective unconscious of Young's or uh, the consciousness of quanta. I mean, I don't know. People are saying this is the most amazing formation that's ever hit the deck and I would kind of agree with them, really. It's the biggest, the most expensive, smashed all records for numbers of circles and geographical spread. Everything about it is like the, the, the absolute pinnacle almost of the whole tw you know, 20 years or so. When I first walked into this thing, so vast, I had absolutely no idea of what I was standing in, just like a sea of circles covering a large proportion of the field. It took us half hour to find the center. It gives one a fairly good impression of the scale of this thing, and that's after looking at hundreds of circles over the years, so we're pretty familiar with geometric shapes and patterns in a field and figuring them out. But this one, I mean, I ask you, 409 circles. <laughs> that's a tall order by anyone's standard. It was raining all night, the night this formation came down. This is a high altitude location, this takes a battering by the weather. We were the first ones in here when this formation arrived. No footprints, no mud, you know, no broken plants, all the centers were perfect. No, no sign of human activity or entry into this field at all. You know, I've seen the result of a team of people or a gang of people smashing around in a cornfield all night. They make a hell of a mess, you just can't help it. It's a, a matter of fact. This was totally inconsistent with everything I know about human-made crop circles. You can't do that in a cornfield, just hit, hit the deck perfectly first time round. No errors, no mistakes, no glitches. It's just here and it arrived in a few hours in perfect condition. Well, certainly in the early days, there was a strong feeling from those of us who were there that there was something around here, there was something of an invisible nature which was around, which was uh, either making the circles or was associated with the circles. And um, from many of the reports, there were reports of uh, balls of light, lights in the sky, suddenly in those early days. And you know, you've heard about the balls of light which everybody sees right. in the crop circle areas in England. Well, often they're seen when there's no crop circle in the field. They're simply in the fields of lights. 
And in most of those cases, after the light bulbs have been photographed or videotaped or whatever, a crop circle will occur in that location, sometimes a week later, or three weeks, a month, whatever. Well, I have seen those balls of light not just at crop circle locations. And this made me think about what they are. Because I, well, I know that what I have seen was not always related to crop circles. Mm -hmm. But then I have seen them again in relation to a crop circle. I mean, don't forget that we've got phenomenal light activity in this area, uh, in daylight as well as in the, the night. And uh, they're not just seen in the summer, they're seen in the winter too. And they're seen by people who just live in the village and you know, have got nothing to do with crop circles. And, you know, so we know there's something weird going on. Avebury, Alton Barnes, you know, that area where they are seen really quite regularly, uh, captured on film several times now. Um, particularly, I mean, those taken by Steve Alexander, for example, um, in 1990. Yeah, we walked from that ground. And we yeah, were just then, about to leave, you see. I was leaving. Saw it, yeah. I was picking up my gear, <laughs> put on my shoulder, and I turned and I saw this object come into view. If it had been actually um, five seconds afterwards, mm, we would have missed this because yeah. we would have carried on up the hill. Now I actually turned round and yes. saw it. Yeah. I mean, it came into view, it turned, then it went down into the corn mm. and it moved through the corn, mm. scampering through that corn. Uh, moving between two formations, crop formations that are in the field, moving from this one to this one. And it knew it what knew it was doing, it, it knew where it was, it was going. Intelligently, yeah. oh, this intelligently it's controlled. Very important. Dropping down into a tractor tyre mark as if it's looking at the tractor tyre mark. Nothing random about it. There's no movement in prevailing wind, it, you know, moving as you would in the direction of the wind if this was a balloon or something similar. You see, the object came down and it stopped for a long time. So I thought I'd pan away to the um, rings to give exactly. you um, yeah. the distance from yeah. actually where the yeah. object was and the rings were. Pan back mm -hmm. and give you an actual relation of the two distances. Mm -hmm. so through all this time it was glinting, flashing all the time. Then it took off. And then of course then it just carried on over the hill, moved up and away, over the actual um, tractor which the farmer was um, in at the time. Hello, that piece of paper. It's a bird. What, a shiny bird? You know, I, I spoke to the tractor driver who was seen on this film that Steve took, and that ball uh, moved, uh, went over the tractor driver's uh, head by about 35, 40 feet. And what the tractor driver sees himself, as you can see on the film, he stops his tractor as he sees this go over the top. And so we have on film this ball of light. Uh, there's no question in my, my mind that whatever those balls of light are, they move in a purposeful manner. If it's a random nat natural thing that's happening, then I think one in a 30, 50, 100 will be filmed. Somebody has a camera and has the cop on to film it. But that's not the case. It's half, even more than half of the sightings are filmed. Like Donald Fletcher, he walks at Barbie Castle, he does not even have his camera on the tripod, there the balls are right already. What's that? What? I can't think what that is. Can you see it moving across? No. What? Where are the cameras pointing? That's a bit of um, dust in it. Fly. The big question is, number one, do you think the balls of, of light are intelligent? Yes. Okay. I'm convinced. And I'm convinced. Mm, no. He's no, not. no. You're not convinced? <laughs> no. No there's, no, there's no real proof of that. What, what I see is an intelligent behaviour.
I'm not too sure are the poles applied themselves to intelligence, or is there something behind it? Oh, I, yes, I, I do yeah. fully agree on that. Part. That's I do believe in so they could be envoys or whatever you want to call devices or probes. Yes, or probes. Could, could be. But it could be that they're intelligent themselves. Right, right. Yes. Yeah. Are they energetic or are they think, a device? I think they're energetic. Okay. I think, yeah, because um, if you look really good at the footages, and you should, should, should analyze them really carefully, is that everybody who sees them the first thing they say is light so they recognize it as a light not as a mechanical thing but as a light do you have any stories of people seeing it more close up and having it interact with their thinking charlie mallard was down here visiting in the park he was a yeah. was sitting in a circle at night and this thing just showed up it was two feet away from his head so you had a ball of light experience right Several actually. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, some very interesting paranormal experiences since getting involved in this situation. Part of my initial motivation for being here was to kind of, if this stuff is being done by something else for whatever reason, I would like to um, be there when it happens, you know? So on this particular occasion, I was, I was in a formation close to here before I actually saw or or physically experienced anything. Probably about three to five minutes before this happened, the whole atmosphere in the formation changed, or at least in this particular part of it. The whole atmosphere around me within the formation became very highly charged, practically electric, uh, to the degree where I was sitting there thinking, you know, this is really weird, you know, should I leave the formation? And I, a ball of light just appeared directly in front of me for some glowing sphere, kind of orange, yellow, translucent, not really casting much of a glow, and it didn't really do much. It just kind of appeared, hovered above the ground for something like a minute, quite a long time. I had enough time to kind of, you know, get up and move around a bit and have a look. And strangely enough, as, as this ball of light appears, the whole subjective, creepy, bizarre feelings all go, and I'm just in a normal, everyday situation, but as this, this ball of light there, it's there for up to a minute and the whole in the ball of light fades out it sort of like fades to nothing over a few seconds and i fell asleep immediately have you guys actually seen your own balls of light in fields or in crop circles mm -hmm. uh, you saw so it was it at night or during the day i only saw one one really ball of light that was at night time it was flowing floating over a crop field slowly took about two minutes to go from one side to the other side this was some, such an ember ball it looked like a fireplace open fireplace so it was getting bigger smaller bigger and just floating slowly until it disappeared behind the shed and i thought that's going to take two seconds and i will see it again and i saw it again yeah, it okay. stopped while it was behind the shed it's mm. very strange how far away were you a couple of hundred meters, yeah. it was pretty distance. I had to use my binoculars to really see yeah. it. Yeah, I saw it, I was there as well. I saw it with the naked eye, but I missed the, the details that he saw because he had the binoculars. Balls of light are certainly seen around the hills here. This is why we have Golden Ball Hill, because there's the memory of balls of light have always been seen there. Are these places of communication with intelligence beyond this physical world? Who knows, but certainly that is in the folklore of the land here. Willow the Wisps, they were called here in England and Germany, they are called Ehrlichter, and uh, they have been observed for centuries. How do we approach phenomena in a way that is open enough that we can actually see what it actually is outside of our own we have to lo We have to lose our illusions and our preconceived ideas. We have to leave that behind, because when we go with preconceived ideas, we see our preconceived ideas. think by analytic process and then what we need to do is we need to synthesize what our analysis reveals. So part of the thing that we do is that we break it, something down into its component elements and then forget to put them back together again to get the larger picture. Ah, yeah. Right. Well that's our science, it was a science, yes, redu the definitely. reductionist aspect One, of things two, that somehow if you analyze all the parts you've got the whole but of course you miss something much bigger and you can never get the whole by just adding the parts back together. Again. Yeah, that's really true. Science has come full circle and realized that 
just dealing with objective knowledge and, and the validation of objective knowledge is giving them an incomplete picture of the universe. And they can't solve some of the problems that they wanted to solve with that incomplete picture. So all of a sudden consciousness has started creeping back into scientific approach to the world. And now consciousness studies are like some of the biggest things even in physics. Physi theoretical physicists are you know, knocking their brains on this issue of consciousness because the subjective element has now been reintroduced into science. Now, consciousness doesn't operate just in a three-dimensional world right. or a four-dimensional world. In fact, physicists think that we live in an 11-dimensional universe, which is mind-blowing in, in itself. And I have a strong suspicion that consciousness has an influence across all of those dimensions. Now, if it sends a projection of itself out into those dimensions, then it's going to end up having all sorts of things generated in the universe. And the shadows of those projections are going to appear in the form of some of the geometrical shapes that we see. I was interested not just in simple circle formation, but the more geometrical versions and thinking, well, how could these be created? And I was very interested in the kinds of shapes that were coming up and how they seemed to be variations, if you like, on a theme. And one of the things I realised was it seemed that these shapes that we're seeing were actually shadows of, shall we say, three-dimensional objects, or maybe even higher, four-dimensional right, objects. Right. For example, if you've got a ball or a sphere and you shine a light on it, the projection, the shadow, is one dimension less. Right. It's um, going to be an ellipse or it's right. going to be a circle. In a similar way, there's a way of holding a cube in such a way that the projection, the shadow, appears as a hexagon. And it appeared to me that these formations, they were a combination of a couple of things. They, they clearly seem to be being generated under the influence of some kind of field, gravitational field. Whatever it was that was being applied had its origins, had its source, if you like, not just in this three-dimensional world. It seems to have been a shadow, if you like, of a higher dimensional object or a higher right, dimensional right. construct. If there is some higher consciousness or whatever interaction from a higher dimension that we're not aware of, what we're seeing is we're effectively seeing the wake that's been left behind by the object as it's gone through our dimension. Say, for instance, if you imagine a speedboat whizzing around the, the bay, you'll get a wake of the water behind it where it's disturbed it. Now, if you don't see that boat, you're just seeing what's left behind. Now, if that object is in the fourth dimension or the fifth dimension or whatever that we can't see, all we're seeing is the aspect left in our dimension. Basically, if you look at this, if you look at this from a cross-sectional view, it's actually a pencil. Now, in one dimension, all you see is like a little line contracting. In two dimensions, you just see a hexagon expanding and contracting. And of course, three dimensions, you can actually see the shape going through. Now, if you imagine this is our world, this could be some entity from a different dimension passing through, and we're basically seeing yeah, in our image. 3D universe the image of it. Mm. So take it <coughs> one step further, looking at it from a crop circle point of view, if you imagine this is poking through. The actual shape here is a tetrahedron with a sphere on each tip. As it more comes into view, you can then end up with the Barbie Castle formation. And if you rotate that round, you'll actually see this particular shape, something like that, where you can see the point there, the two points there, and that point is off-centred there as it rotates round. Obviously, Barbie Castle, it would be in the centre, so you'd be looking at it straight on. Now, if you've then got two of these shapes, you'll see the second one is starting to spin in and interlock with the first one and then you get this shape which appeared at Etchelhampton, the central circle and the six circles around it. If you then continue twisting them around like that, that shape actually appeared up north. It was sort of um, off-centred um, 
Star of David type formation. Obviously, if I run it as a continuous animation, you can see how the lock locks together. I want to put some of the more up-to-date formations in there because I'm convinced this will be another aspect to the genuine phenomena because you'll find all the genuine ones probably interlock to other formations. So although you're looking at lots of different formations, you're actually looking at a single aspect or different aspects of a single higher dimensional shape which is just going through our universe. So we're in the um, single small Julia set at Chiselden, south of Swindon, discovered Friday morning, the second. Uh, it's, the floral lay is very, very beautiful. And the plants you can see are under here, breaking into this circle. It's very intricate and spiraling around clockwise. And then it leaves over the top once more, around, continuing around the circumference of the initial circle. And then once it's reached here, breaks into the next one. And so on, down through the chain. In the 17th century, uh, people, when confronted with these shapes, called them either fairy rings or mowing devils or strange markings in the grounds, and they were absolutely convinced it was done by either the devil or infernal spirit or witchcraft, because that was the mindset of the time. Anything that was outside the norm was obvious that it was done by the devil, because that's all they could see. And it was obvious it was done by witchcraft, because that was the way they saw things. So now, when something out of the ordinary comes, well, it's obvious that it's, that it's a hoax, that it's man-made. Yeah, I think hoaxes are indeed part of the phenomenon in that they keep it a mystery. That is, it's always possible to say, oh, I know this or that was done by somebody, they're all done by somebody. And see, so people who don't particularly want to think about it have an easy way out. And that every phenomenon should allow that. So people don't, it shouldn't be so challenging that you can't avoid it. If you want to avoid it, you can say, oh, I know it's a hoax, and get off the subject. I accept that hoaxes exist. I don't believe every single thing that appears in the field is a genuine thing. But a hoaxing doesn't explain the phenomena. If hoaxing offered an answer to what goes on in our fields, year in, year out, then OK. But it doesn't. Um, these things are happening all over the world. They're happening all over Britain. They've been happening for, what, since the late 60s, early 70s? They've been documented since the 70s. You know, you're talking 30 years. These, these, these guys were kids. Who was doing them then? We've been having formations for 10 years. Are you telling me that people are, every summer, for 10 years? have been going out night after night after night creating formation. I mean, it doesn't make any sense, does it? And where do they practice? Yeah, where do they, where practice? do they practice? Where's the practice ones? Are you, you know, they don't practice, there's never a half-finished one. No mistakes. You know, I mean, it just doesn't, that doesn't make sense. And how do they get away with it? How are they not caught? How have they done it? If anyone said they'd done it, I'd be very interested to know, uh, very interested to know how it was done. Because I can't, at the moment, see any uh, way in which this can be done physically by the old stomping out teams. And when you get the real masterpieces, the hoaxes sort of fall away and they just stand back in admiration like everybody else. And these masterpieces, that, 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 there's never a blunder in them. Now, something incredibly ambitious and very elaborate. 
and you won't find any stupid mistake in them. And it's unforgiving medium. If you fall over in that wheat crop, the wheat's not going to stand up again easily. Saying that people have been going out for years and years, all over the country, all over the world. I mean, how many people are we talking about? And what kind of an obsession have they got? You know, I mean, they go out in rain, they go out, you know, in all weathers, in crops like oilseed rape, which stinks, covers you in yellow. It's a horrible crop to be in. The lack of being caught, the lack of blunders, the lack of... Uh, you don't see a half-finished masterpiece. As a cock crows, they would have to pack up tools. It's, uh, they give, all give the impression of being done in one go. They're not spot-on accurate, but they've got a rhythm through them, like an artist would do. But then you look at it from afar, and when you go on an airplane and you see the whole thing, you see that it's actually not just a splodge in the field, it's a very specific shape, a design, and it's a symbolic design, and therefore it has a meaning to it. It carries an inner meaning. It carries a metaphysical, it's a metaphysical thing. It tells us the meaning beyond the physical. Each circle is an invitation to look into the meaning of the symbol and therefore you're made to look at all these wonderful, wonderful teachings in all directions and suddenly your mind is, is encompassing many, many different aspects, it has an effect on the person. You recover your sense of awe, your sense of wonder. A feeling of awe leads to a feeling of appreciation, of gratitude. You begin to have a feeling of reverence towards the whole, towards the greater. These things are footprints of intelligences. And through the characteristics of the phenomenon which come forward each year, we're being shown characteristics of the particular kind of intelligence which these... Even the word being is... These beings, it, even that is inadequate. Mm -hmm. But, um, and so we're being given some detailed signs of the nature of this intelligence, which is undoubtedly very compassionate and understanding and also educationally motivated. There is something very profound about the shapes of the crop circles that affect consciousness. I think there are ways in which we can interact with our environment that can enhance consciousness and I think crop circles are part of that. Mm. I think um, that almost there is a technology behind them and that that technology is, is consciousness enhancing technology. There's a trickster element. Mm -hmm. There's an exceptionally high level element too, which involves, for example, complex mathematics. And there are multifaceted other elements which we're only just touching into, but the focus I've been giving, anyway, has been not so much the formations and the phenomena, but actually what is the empty space which these are containing? And what is the essence which these are demonstrating mm -hmm. in terms of the effects of these mysterious intelligences, mm -hmm. which even from an, an advanced esoteric viewpoint, you can't give a name to it. You can't say, oh, it's angels, oh, it's ETs, mm -hmm. oh, it's the past, oh, it's something else, the collective unconscious, you can't, that, that doesn't satisfy the question either. We're, we're left with this deep pool, this empty space into which to fall. <laughs> the question that you get asked, what makes crop circles, it is a non-question, it's an impossible question because I'm not sure necessarily that there even is a source. I've got this funny feeling it's some weird feedback <laughs> loop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're yeah. created almost spontaneously by the interest in them and yet by some... Uh, we'll never know. You'll never get to point A 
It's mm. a loop. I bet you, if you could, <laughs> if you could try and trace it back, you'd never get to the answer. You just go round and round, yeah. and, and it's almost like they're created from nowhere, out of nothing, like everything is. I'm sure there's a dimensionality to this, yeah. which we are just not capable of seeing at the moment. It's obviously clear that the, the circle makers are, are going to great trouble to keep these designs coming down. And if you assume that there is some kind of code in here, it's not just nice designs, but there's some sort of code, then they're obviously putting in a lot of code into, into the system here. And if it is code, which surely it must be in some way, um, there's a lot of unravelling to be done at some future date. I think there are myriad communities, intelligences, civilizations up there, and I think it's reasonable to say that the majority of them are fully aware of planet Earth and its divinities and miracles and charms and its madnesses and follies. I think we're in the early stages of, uh, of a process of universal intercultural mingling. The issue is it's got to be done very, very gradually in, in homeopathic amounts so that we actually develop, amongst other things, a certain immunity to the potentially destructive influence of incredible positive energy coming our way when we open up to the other beings in the universe in which we live. I think they do know that um, their material intervention in tangible terms would cause such disruption to our culture that we would unravel and fragment very quickly and they don't want that. So I believe this is one reason that they're playing very gently with us. And it's certainly a reason why they're playing with those groups and individuals who wish, who choose, who volunteer to come and participate. I mean, you know, traditionally, what do, what do we think in our culture? They go and knock on the door of number 10 Downing Street. They go and visit the White House. Well, they'd be stupid. Do we, do we have to be told that? I mean, the last way um, anybody with any kind of wisdom and full historic understanding of the state of planet Earth the last way they would attempt to make ameliorative changes would be to initiate it at government level. That would be the kiss of death. And they know that. One of the possible reasons why all this farce is going on is that they're studying us. Because obviously, you know, if you were a god or an ET or something like that, you would be sincerely asking the question, why can't these humans wake up and stop this suicide process they're on? <laughs> you know, what is it that causes them to continually make difficulty for themselves and kill each other and cause so much pain? And so you could see it as a research project by these beings to, to provoke us with the the stimulus of, uh, you know, just putting it in front of us and then to study all the ways in which we avoid truth being put straight in front of our face, you know? Because they're getting it. They're getting all these avoidance strategies, blocking strategies, confusion. You know, if you were a, if you were a cosmic social psychologist, it would be a wonderful <laughs> uh, microscope into the psyche of humanity. Uh, and, in, uh, and if that were the only justification for this phenomenon, that, that itself would be sufficient, I think. I think that they've been looking at us for a long time and thinking, oh, God. How long do we have to sit back here and watch these clowns screw themselves up? 
at what point are we going to be allowed to just move in and tickle them and persuade them and seduce them forward? At what point can we break this terrible pat pattern? Are we going to watch this beautiful blue planet screw itself up finally? Do we have to watch this? Can we go in? And now they're coming in. Now, clearly, you know, because we are who we are, we want, we want spaceships on the White House lawn. At one point, I think, being involved in this, I thought, I kind of saw the circle makers as this huge intelligence out there that had all the answers that was trying to teach us something truly profound and and in a way I think that's partially true but the way I see it now is that kind of we're playing this game together that there's kind of this dance going on and it and it's a mutual exploration of what is possible through the relationship that we have through the kind of communication that we have and which is very strange to us and maybe is very strange to them as well, who knows? But I kind of more see it now as not this kind of all-encompassing intelligence that has the, all these answers that they're trying to teach us, but more of it being this wonderful dance of, of um, two intelligences together and just pushing the envelope and the boundaries of what's possible and exploring together what would be possible through a, an interaction or a communication between the two. I know that this is interactive and then I know there is a communication and I know that I am shown which way to go and while on the one hand this might sound like God speaks through me, um, I don't see it that way at all and I know many, 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 many people in their work around the crop circles who are receiving nudges, encouragements, directions, clues, hints to draw them forward. For years, um, in the early 90s, uh, we tried a series of experiments using a psychic channeler just to see what would happen to take messages to whatever the circle-making forces might be. And as soon as we started those experiments, I mean, I think on the very first day we had a big meeting at this friend's house in the field closest to his house as you could get. The first formation of the year in our county appeared. And we thought, what are the odds of that? And what we found was as the next couple of years went on, we all started to have these synchronicities. Um, three or four of us saw balls of light. Um, eventually, this kind of work culminated. Uh, we did an experiment where nine of us meditated up on a hillside and asked for a crop formation, and others have done this uh, on other occasions too. And we had a certain shape that we thought might arise as a result of that. And lo and behold, that very night, exactly that design appeared in the fields of Sussex. You know, I can't prove that to the outside world, but we had proved to ourselves that it was an interactive phenomenon. The more you give towards it, it will give back. Mm. Yeah, yeah. For someone who's studying radionuclides, they will get progression in that study. For someone who's studying mathematics, they will get progression in that. For someone who's working psychologically, they will get progression in that. In whatever way we map our reality, we will get progression into it and none, no one individual possesses the answer, although we're all progressing with clues. Oh, well, you go by, uh, you judge the intent by what the actual effect is, don't you? If people say, what are crop circles? Or if you ask about a person, what sort of person he is, it says in the Bible, by their fruits you shall know them. It's what they do, not what they say. And so to observe, to, to find what the crop circles are for, you really have to observe what they do, how they change people and in what direction. Are they satanic? No, there's no evil or harm in them at all, as far as I can see. They never hurt anybody. They never harmed anybody. They've only inspired people, and some people have been disappointed by them, or by, by some aspect of them, but that's their own uh, um, personal business. They haven't hurt anybody. I think... 
that the crop circles maybe are occurring now because there are huge universal time cogs about to clonk over and this has been this has been in the stars for a long time and we've been blissfully stupidly unaware of what we were sitting on but they know and i think the crop circles have been brought now because they have been saying these guys are gonna miss the boat this is one of the most exciting things and they don't know what's going on. How can we bring them forward? How can we open their eyes? How can we open their hearts? And I put my money on the fact that we'll have contact when we are sufficiently grown up and evolved to be able to accept it. And we have a very accelerated uh, program of learning or to be able to accept it and to be integrated into a wider and heavenly scheme of things i think we're right on the edge of it i speak as an optimist Oh